welcome you to another in our ongoing series of discussions about the scriptures of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm Andrew Skinner, Dean of Religious Education at Brigham Young University. To my left, joining us today for our discussion is Professor Victor Ludlow, Professor of Ancient Scripture at BYU. Welcome, Victor. Good to be here. Across the table from me, Professor Dana Pike, also of the Department of Ancient Scripture. Nice to have you with us again, Dana. Nice to be here, Andy. And to my right, Professor Richard Draper, Professor of Ancient Scripture at BYU. A genuine pleasure, as always, Richard. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Good to be here. We are right in the middle of the book of Ezekiel, and uh, for those that are just uh, joining us, we said as an introduction to uh, the book of Ezekiel that Ezekiel is a prophet priest who was carried into exile, carried into Babylon from Judah uh, about 597 B.C. In Judah, um, he was... Um, a common man, or excuse me, a priest, but had more to do with the commoners than some of the other prophets that we have uh, noted before. When he gets to Babylon, he receives his call as a prophet, and we come to understand from his own writings that uh, he lives in a house with, uh, with relative autonomy in Babylon. He knows that the people are going to be there a long time. Uh, we know that he has a wife, for example, but we know that to carry out his mission among this rebellious group of people is sometimes tough sledding, to say the least. We pick up in chapter 12 of Ezekiel by noting um, a device, a prophetic device, that Ezekiel has employed before, and uh, that's the idea of prophetic reenactment, where Ezekiel says and does things to portray to the people what in fact is going to be their lot during this long 70 year period of captivity. Yeah, that's verse 11. It says... Mm -hmm. In say, chapter 12. That in chapter 12, yes, yeah, say, I am your sign, like as I have done, so shall it be unto them. They shall remove and go into captivity. So Ezekiel is the sign. So it's a type. Uh, type. Mm -hmm. you what, see his me, actions. You, you can see yourself. This is something that's going to happen to you as well. Very good, very good. And, and I guess the, the reason we want to point that out is because we do see some consistent practices, con some consistent language, some consistent themes appearing and reappearing again and again in the book of Ezekiel. And this is just one of those, the device that the Lord commissions Ezekiel to use, which is, I, I think, a, I would find it a very difficult way to pursue my ministry, but Ezekiel does it, and, and I, we never hear him complain. He's a great I might, prophet. I might point out here, too, in chapter 12, one of the problems, one of the uh, challenges Ezekiel has, and that is that the prophecy that he is making isn't coming to pass yet. And therefore, in verse 22, the Lord speaking, Son of man, meaning Ezekiel, what is the proverb that ye have in the land of Israel, saying the days are prolonged and every vision faileth. So the people aren't believing him yeah. because it, it's not happening. Mm -hmm. It's not happening. But, but it soon it will. will. Oh, yeah, right. it, it will. Yeah, we're in this period between 597 and 586 where we're getting closer and closer to this terrible right. destruction to right. take place in Jerusalem. And so this symbolic prophecy that we've mentioned at the beginning of 12, the Lord says, Go out in broad daylight, pack your stuff in your knapsack, throw it on your shoulder, dig through the wall, and, and head off into the twilight yeah. <laughs> as, the night, the as the night as the night falls. Be doing. And he says, "This is this is the yeah, sign, right? It. That they're going to be removed, taken into captivity, just like this early group of of uh, Judahites have already been taken away in 597. Yeah. It's going to mm -hmm. it's going to keep happening." Very yeah. good. And the Lord warns them in verse 28. Thus saith the Lord God, "There shall none of my words be prolonged any more, but the word which I have spoken." shall be done, saith the Lord. So the time is getting short. I mean, he's, he's uh, going to move right. right away here. What, what follows then are a series of prophecies given by Ezekiel to the people, to the Jews, uh, Israelites that are living in the land of Babylon. Chapter 13, uh, a, a section of prophecies where Ezekiel um, talks about and calls into question false prophets. Um, 
and, uh, and and we've seen the rise of false prophets in Israel before, and we've had warnings clear back from the time of Moses to beware of false prophets and prophetesses, apparently, and, and as prophetesses, well, speak sure, pleasing words. In other words, they'll tell you what you want to hear, not what I want you to Smooth. hear. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and which reminds us, of course, of uh, President Spencer W. Kimball, who says that the true prophet of the Lord tells the people what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a great burden that all prophets carry, I, sh I should think. Um, yeah. Chapter 14, um, a message to um, repent, <clears throat> even though this group of 10,000 of Israel's best has already been in exile now, approaching 10 years, they have some repenting to do, and it's a cry to that cry to repentance. Also, certainly pertains to the to the Judahites that are left back in Jerusalem. Right. There are a couple of interesting details in chapter 14. If we can please address them for a minute, even right in the first verse, chapter 14, verse one. Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me, Ezekiel, and sat before me. I think it's helpful for Latter Day Saints to appreciate when it says elders of Israel. These are the leaders of the people. These aren't Melchizedek priesthood holding yeah. elders like the we old might men, think in of. Other words. The, the, the wise, older, the leaders, mature leaders. Different right. Different and again, he, they're in Babylonia, somewhere out away from the capital city of Babylon. He's in his house. They've come to him. I really like the, the, the language here. Verse 3, son of man. And again, we've we mentioned in a previous session that son of man in the book of Ezekiel is a title that means human or mortal that the Lord keeps using as he addresses Ezekiel. These men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? They're, they're coming to you, the prophet, to get answers from me, but yeah. they've got idols in their hearts. And I, it's just really interesting language. Their sins, their their pride and the, and, the, and the things that they think maybe are hidden, the Lord sees right through that. And so we get that expression and again in verse 4 and again in verse 7, they've set up idols in their hearts. Mm -hmm. um, clearly out of sync with what the Lord's expecting. They've got their own agenda. Yes, yes. yes. Oh, and, and then that precludes them from being able to hear the word of the Lord because of that very thing. When the right. heart is wrong, right. they, can't, apparently they can't this hear. Is, yeah, and this is so strong in him and towards the end of the chapter here, he says, even if you had, I mean, if you think of, of your Israelite past, even if you had somebody like a Noah or Daniel who again is a contemporary of Ezekiel and these people, but Daniel's in the royal court and is doing visions and obviously mm -hmm. well recognized uh, by the Babylonians as well as uh, as the Jews. And Job, a, a famous Old Testament person, even if they were here, you know, if it wasn't just Ezekiel kind of as a lone voice in the wilderness among the Jews, uh, even if they were here, they, they wouldn't be able to save you. And he goes back and forth here, mentioning him in alternate verses here in 14 and 16 and 18 and 20. Uh, uh, even if they were here, still these things would happen. Even if they were here, these things would happen. Even if they were here, these things would happen. I mean, he just is hammering this point across to, even if you had the best of the ancient prophets and current prophets here, you just are not inclined to change at all. Right. Sounds a lot like Too the Savior, them. doesn't it? Right. He, he, he says something very, very similar as he's uh, crying repentance to the people. Well, and it's, it's a good thing to remember. I think sometimes we talk in generalizations, all these Israelites were just this way or that way. I mean, there were f faithful families like sure. Lehi and Sariah and their kids yeah. and Ezekiel and his family, Daniel, Jeremiah and his family, but, but that critical weight of, of iniquity has just Mm -hmm. pull the scale too far, too far to one side. And, uh, well, what, what follows then, are another series of revelations, uh, with the one recorded in chapter 15, Jerusalem or Judah is compared to a burnt vine, uh, must have been a very graphic image of how useless they had become uh, as uh, as the covenant people. They haven't done anything at this point that they're right. supposed Isaiah to be doing. Isaiah has an allegory of a vineyard in chapter 5, the yeah. same thing, this wild bitter fruit. Well, you can yeah. just let it take up space? No, you, you yeah. get rid of it, you burn it. It's non-productive. It's not bringing yeah. forth the spiritual fruits That's that they right. should have been doing. You know, some people, some Christians have connected uh, Jesus' teaching in John 15 about being the true vine and how we have to be part of that to have life to, to, sure. the, to the 
opposite, the antithesis of the vine use in, in here in Ezekiel. It seems like there's a lot of images in the New Testament that Jesus and his apostles and, and others pick up upon that are, that are Ezekiel. directly yeah. lifted from Ezekiel. Yeah. Chapter 16, uh, again, the word of the Lord came unto me, talking about the abominations in Jerusalem. Jerusalem has, has become as a harlot. I think pointing out that, um, that this concept of idolatry as spiritual adultery is one of the worst sins that can be committed by a covenant group of people. Mm -hmm. And it's been, it goes all the way back, I think, to the Pentateuch, to, the, to Moses' day, where he's the first one to talk about idolatry as spiritual adultery because adultery was such wickedness. Everybody knew it. They could not mistake that. Mm -hmm. Chapter 17, um, I don't know if we need to say anything about that. Chapter 18, uh, we start to get to, into some important doctrinal concepts. Uh, and specifically, I think we ought to say something about the, the doctrine of uh, individual accountability for sin, because that's the message of this revelation. Uh, to the people is the important doctrine behind it. Yeah, I think we should read the first few verses of Please. chapter 18 and, and talk about it. you want me to read? Yeah. yeah. All right, chapter 18, verse 1. The word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, What mean ye? And again, the Hebrew here is plural, right? This is you Israelites, not just yeah. Ezekiel himself. What mean ye? And ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. Everybody know what that means? It's an interesting proverb. It's an interesting yeah. proverb. Those people before us did things that were wrong, and we're getting the results of it. Yeah. And you can just, I can at least see, knowing human nature, at least some of these it's their fault. Folks that are over in Babylon saying, if they had, that generation before us hadn't done what they did, we wouldn't have been over here. And then, but the Lord goes on in verse 3 and says, As I live, saith the Lord God, ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sins, it shall die. And while we're hearing judgment and prophecies of, of death and destruction. Uh, primarily, the sense here is you're going to die spiritually. spiritually. Yeah. yeah. What, one of the uh, plays that is going on within Israel is they, they know the message of the book of Job. They also know the message of Abraham's prayer for uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. And so uh, some are, are feeling that if, if there's just a few righteous uh, the rest of us can do whatever we want to. They can That's intercede it. for us. Oh, yeah, they, they will okay. intercede for us. Right. And so we've got here as, as kind of a balance between individual responsibility and also the fact, and you mentioned this in a previous session, Dana, that the weight of evil can become so great that it overpowers any good that can happen. And the sad part is, as Ezekiel's going to find out, is when that happens, the righteous suffer. In fact, uh, what you said before as you were reading the parable uh, is picked up again in verse 20 of that same chapter where we really start to see the doctrine of individual accountability. That's not to, to completely obliterate the idea that there is a corporate responsibility within right. covenant Israel, right. but it is to say you're not, you know, not going to be punished just because somebody else did something wrong. Mm -hmm. Verse 20, the soul that sinneth it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Which is one of the, the tragedies of what's going to happen in here, in that Ezekiel's prophecies, these gloomy, terrible prophecies, did not have to come to pass. But it was, it was because right. the people would not turn to the Lord. Yeah. That's right. And uh, verse 23, the, the Lord basically is saying, have I any pleasure at all in the wicked that should die? I mean, does God really want this destruction to take place? Well, the answer is no, saith the Lord God. Uh, well, look at verse 20. he should return from his ways and live. 
I was going to say, look at verse 22, which really is a clear uh, reference to repentance. All mm -hmm. his transgress transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. And so Ezekiel is, is really teaching us the doctrine of sin and repentance and, and accountability and consequences. Right. I think it is worth noting that, that if, if any of us, for example, were to uh, deny the faith, that, that could have an impact on our children. Um, yeah. They won't, they be, won't accountable, be accountable, they, responsible for us. They may see the, the impact, but the Lord sure. will still judge them for what they do with what they know. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that that's, so. a, that's a great comment that you made. Thank you. So, so the Lord's admonition then in verse 31, cast away from you all your transgressions whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Oh, keep going. Read, yeah, read right. the next sure. For I have no pleasure in death of them that dieth, saith the Lord your God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. And this turn is their common way of, 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 of pronouncing or admonishing repentance. Turn, return, turn back yeah. is, is their common word. Just right. like you don't see the word faith much in the Old Testament. They talk about trust in the Lord or follow Him, keep His commandments. And repentance, it's this idea of a pivotal point. You, yep. you, you come away from the wicked and start towards, towards the God. righteous. Well, and we're going to see that again, particularly in chapter 33, where the Lord uses that verb, shuv, shuv, return, return ye to me. And that's the, the real meaning behind repentance. Um, chapter 20 uh, is one that uh, hammers home the point that Israel is nothing now but a recalcitrant sinner. Uh, and, and from the, the days of their deliverance from Egypt to the day of Ezekiel, it has been the breaking of the covenant that has led up to this catastrophe, which will, in, in just a short time now, result in the destruction of Jerusalem. But even worse, the city is bad enough. But what's worse is the apple of their eye, the temple, will be destroyed. And that's what he's, he's pointing yeah, I mean, us to. You go back to the end of the Exodus, and here Moses has a new generation, yeah. Joshua. They're going into their promised land. And now here we are some 600 plus years yeah. later. And unfortunately, all we've seen is just a gradual but steady decline all the way through. And it's, it, 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 it's, a, it's a little discouraging sometimes to read all this material and see that pattern of decline. Yeah. Well, I, I'm going to ask if we can jump ahead to, to chapter 24 because uh, something, uh, there's, a, there's a couple, two or three important lessons that are taught in chapter 24. Uh, we've already mentioned the fact that God's judgment against Judah in the form of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple is irrevocable at this point. There's nothing more that, that can be done. But the Lord again commissions Ezekiel to uh, engage this prophetic reenactment to teach Israel to teach uh, the exiles how they need to react and what they should do in the reaction when they get the news that that the, the temple is destroyed. It also teaches an interesting thing about uh, about Ezekiel's family life. What do we learn for the first time in chapter 24? We learn that... Well, it, he's married. He's married. And, and here in verse 15 uh, uh, through 24, it talks about his wife dying, but he is to not to do any mourning, yeah. which, like these earlier examples, is a type that, I mean, so much catastrophe and death and loss has happened to him, their emotional wells have run dry. I mean, you can't even bring tears anymore because it's, it's become so, so commonplace. And Ezekiel himself, verse 24, is unto you for a sign. Uh, even the prophet, who is surely a, an empathetic, sensitive individual and loved his wife, he is not even to shed tears for her loss. What's, what's amazing to me is this, is this parallel that, that uh, Ezekiel invokes uh, through the prompting of the Lord. Chapter 24, verse 16, Son of man, behold, I take away from thee the desire of thine eyes with a stroke, yet neither shalt thou mourn nor weep, neither shalt thou thy, thy tears run down, as you point out. Well, that's his wife. And then look at verse 21. It, the parallel is pronounced in verse 21. Speak 
Ezekiel is to speak unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will profane my sanctuary, the excellency of your strength, the desire of your eyes, that which your soul pitieth, and your sons and your daughters. So just as uh, Ezekiel's wife was the desire of his eyes, the temple was the desire of Israel's eyes. Both are going to be taken away yeah. at this period. Now, you wanted to go well, back. Yeah, I, I was just a little bothered by something you said earlier, that, that Ezekiel is, sees that, that it can't be changed for the people in Israel. I think the passage we read in chapter 18, at the end especially, there, my view anyway, it can be, but it, I think the Lord's yeah. telling him it's not going to be. Mm -hmm. All right, It's still not quite too late, but they're they're up to the they're up to the buzzer just about and time's running out but i think the lord is letting ezekiel know that it's not going to happen that the repentance isn't going to if the lord's still got his hand stretched out saying you can turn yeah but i know in my heart of hearts you're not going to yeah, turn yeah he's given some examples here in these chapters i mean your your sister samaria you saw what's happened to her they right. were warned and yeah. they didn't they did. respond so hopefully you're getting learn. your final warning this is now it. but this is it this is what's coming. And again, we, we should remind ourselves and that, that Jeremiah is back in Jerusalem saying the same thing to the people over sure. there. It's, mm -hmm. it's just about out of time, and if you don't turn yeah. now, everything's going to come well, I, tumbling I, I, down. Yeah, and, and I think maybe our, our um, difference was, is, a semantic, it may is a semantic one. But, but I do think that the Lord knows that they won't. Ezekiel now knows. Jer Jeremiah now knows. Right. Mm -hmm. it, right. it looks pretty irrevocable to me. But anyway, that's... At this stage. At this yes. stage, right. at this point, yeah. And okay. this, again, this has been over 10 years he's been giving right. him this message, yeah. And, yeah. and they're just locked into it. Anything, you, anybody else want to say anything about chapter 24? Because th this is, we now enter kind of a new section of the book of Ezekiel, uh, maybe what we would call the, the second out of two or three divisions uh, in the book of Ezekiel. The first division was chapters 1 through 24, pre-destruction prophecies, and, and now chapters 25 through what, maybe 32, 32. Are, are prophecies to nations, and we don't know whether these were given kind of during right. this time or kind of as a new block, but they're obviously put they're, together they're just, together here, just yes. like we see uh, 13 through 23 yeah. of Isaiah and Amos and others have prophecies to the nations. Well, and, and, and these seven nations, Ammon, Moab, Edom, Philistia, Tyre, Sidon, Egypt, it seems to me that what the Lord is saying in these chapters is that they're going to come to realize and know the power of God uh, because the, of the destruction and the, and the bad things that are going to happen to them yeah, as well. And, yeah, and just uh, picking up on the, on the thesis again that we've mentioned once before, and that is Ezekiel really shows not only the accountability of the individual and of the nation, but also the fact that God is over all, that uh, he is the master of everything that's going on everywhere, and things will follow his way, or there shall be consequences. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think we see another item here, this idea of one of the fruits of a prophet, if he's also a seer and a revelator, is what he says is going to happen, happen. And, and, and Bible scholars take a look at, at his description, like in chapter 26 of, 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 of Tyre, uh, and then later see what in, in reality happened. Mm -hmm. it's, so, it's so accurate that some of them that are more critical almost say, well, this must have been, he must have given a general warning. Somebody's come back and filled yeah, in all the, the detail because it's yeah. so precise and exact. Yeah. And granted, like, like, like Korahor tried to tell the people in Alma 30, you know, oh, you can't see into the future. You can't know of the future. Well, maybe we as mortals can. But God can, and the question is, can we see eye to eye with what God sees as he reveals his word to us? And, of course, that's what a seer does. He sees the things that God sees, and, right. and that's one of the verifications of his calling is that what he saw does happen as the Lord had revealed it to him. And, yeah. and therefore, we, sh we should yield. The Lord knows the future. The Lord knows what is out there, and therefore, we should, we should trust him. We should put our our faith in him and move forward as he would like. Yeah, and as, as we move forward into chapter 33, verse 21, um, we hear that all these things Ezekiel has been prophesying have come to pass. 33, 21, it came to pass in the 12th year of our captivity, 12 years after 597, 
B.C. In the tenth month, the fifth day of the month, that one had a, who had escaped out of Jerusalem came to me saying, The city is smitten. The hand of the Lord, which was upon me in that evening, escaped. And I'm no more dumb, right? He had been, his, his tongue had been yeah. uh, restricted by the Lord, uh, except when he had to speak on behalf of the Lord. But now that the temple has been destroyed, the prophecies have been fulfilled, and he's gotten that indication that everything he said came to pass, just as the Lord had told him. Now he's able to speak. And so, talking about blocks of text, from 33 to the end of the book, 48, uh, now it becomes a sense of consolation and looking to the future. The first half of Ezekiel, judgment, doom, if you don't repent, it's going to be the end. Now the end of the temple and the city has come. The sovereign kingdom of Judah as a political entity is no more after 586. Uh, and so the rest of Ezekiel's mission is looking to the future. Now what's going to happen? And, and the tone, it seems to me, of Ezekiel changes, it changes dramatically. dramatically. And yes. now we're, he, he's in the comforting mode of, yes. of his prophetic ministry. Yes. Yeah. I have a, a statement, Dean, by Joseph Smith that I really think sums up what Ezekiel's doing up to this Please. point of vindication. Uh, Joseph Smith wrote, The Lord had declared by the prophet it's Ezekiel, that the people should each one stand for himself and depend on no man or men in that state of corruption of the Jewish church. In other words, they had to be righteous on their own terms. You cannot say, I'm corrupt because the church is corrupt. That, that righteous person can only be, uh, uh, that righteous persons can only deliver their own souls. Then he says, this applies to the present state of the Church of Latter-day Saints. If the people depend, excuse me, if the people depart from the Lord, they must fall. They are depending on the prophet and hence are darkened in their own minds for neglect of themselves, envious toward the innocent, while they afflict vir virtue with their shafts of en en uh, envy. And his idea is, you cannot depend on anybody but you. You, you are responsible. Excellent. Thank you very much. For more information on this program, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org.